It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. On the sidelines of the BRICS summit in Goa, India, a few weeks ago, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi confirmed shared interest on international matters, as well as large-scale investments, and signed various agreements. The deals signed included a commitment from Russia's oil giant Rosneft pledging to invest $13 billion in India's ESA oil. Also, an information security deal was signed to curb terrorism and drug trafficking. Billions of dollars' worth of arms agreements, including an intergovernmental agreement for five S-400 Triumphs, which are air defense systems, as well as four steel frigates, which are warships, and a joint venture to manufacture CAM of 226T helicopters in India. On to talk about all of this with me is Vijay Prashad. Vijay Prashad is Professor of International Studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He is the author of over 18 books, including Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, and The Death of a Nation and the Future of Arab Revolution. Vijay, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, thanks. All right, Vijay, explain to us the significance of these energy and military deals signed by Russia and India. And to what extent do you think this is a shift away from India's dealings with the U.S., particularly in terms of arms deals? So let's put it this way first, Charmini, that the Indian government on issues of uh, these kind of deals is quite mercenary. You know, they're looking for... Uh, a good way to get their weaponry and to finance the energy sector. So the Indian government has gone to all sides of the political equation, if we look at or the geopolitical equation, to get arms. India is the biggest importer of arms from Israel, and now India wants to do joint ventures with Russia to produce arms inside India. So in that sense, I don't think we should exaggerate the politics of this, although I'll come to that in a minute. The main point is India has sought uh, somebody to come in and do joint venture arm production inside India. In fact, the, uh, Mr. Modi has made a big deal of this uh, by pushing for two things. One is uh, he has called ideologically for something called make in India. That means production in India. And secondly, he has opened foreign direct investment for defense into India. These two things combined... Uh, will lead almost directly into this deal with the Russians where some stealth fighters and ships and other things will be built uh, inside India, uh, presumably not just for the Indian market, but for export uh, to other countries in the world. This is a very big deal uh, for the Indian arms production sector. You know, India is the largest importer of arms in the world. So the expectation is if you're going to be producing your own, own arms, you want to hemorrhage your uh, foreign exchange, uh, you know, for buying arms. Of course, the prior question is, why does India need uh, to be the world's largest purchase of arms? It's, there's an obscenity there. There are scarce public resources. Is this really the best kind of industry that India needs? But nonetheless, this is an avenue. And Russia came in uh, to uh, support uh, this agenda of the Modi government. And really, it's not just the Modi government. It's a consensus of the various uh, mainstream political parties in India that there should be arms manufacturing inside India. So that part of it, I think, is um, less surprising. Uh, uh, equally unsurprising is the enormous investment uh, coming into India's energy sector. You know, India is very energy uh, import reliant, relies on oil from the Gulf, relies on natural gas imports, etc. And because there's this pressure on India to pivot from carbon to some other fuel, to some other kind of energy source, uh, India has gone in a big way uh, into nuclear instead of solar. You know, that's another political choice that this government and the previous co Congress government has made. They've made a big push into nuclear. When they signed the nuclear deal with the United States, the United States hoped very much that Westinghouse would be the beneficiary. In other words, an American firm would be the beneficiary of India's uh, p tilt to or uh, pivot to the nuclear option. Instead, of course, now it's uh, been clear that the Russians are going to come in very quickly and provide uh, nuclear material, you know, build the reactors, etc. 
So that's one part of this energy uh, infusion. The second is this enormous deal signed between the Russian oil company and the Indian government's oil company for $12.9 billion. It's a very big deal uh, for the purchase of, of refineries and for putting in investment into upgrading uh, some of the refinery structure, because India, as I said, is, is a major importer of oil. So they put a lot of money um, into the infrastructure of energy for India. These are not necessarily choices that a progressive government would, would make. In other words, you know, strengthening oil, entering nuclear. But this is the agenda that this government has picked. So, Vijay, of course, these have advantages to Russia as well. And what are they? Well, for Russia, there are several things. You know, one is Russia and China have, over the course of the last several years, uh, built up this big infrastructural plan uh, to pivot away from Europe. You know, some of this was motivated not by ideology, but by the problem of the sanctions around Ukraine. The Russians were seeking other avenues to sell natural gas, so they pivoted to China, another country heavily reliant on the import of energy. So there is this kind of new Asian discussion about energy and markets and building up a kind of Asian pole vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of the world. There is a more natural fit between Russia and China because they have a similar kind of orientation vis-a-vis -vis the, with the West. India, on the other hand, has a favorable, at least this government and the previous government, has a favorable understanding with the West, close uh, uh, you know, relations with the United States, with the U.S. military. So some of this is, in, a, in that sense, mercenary. It's about commerce, not necessarily about politics or geopolitics. On the other hand, very interestingly, at the BRICS summit, during the uh, signing of these documents, Mr. Modi, the prime minister, said that he is in agreement with the Russians in terms of what's going on in the Middle East and in other parts of the world. Uh, this is a very curious development. You know, uh, the current Indian government, a right-wing government, has an antithetical relationship with the Chinese, is very pro-American, and yet this kind of pragmatism of the deal has shown that Mr. Modi is also saying uh, things that are probably not uh, received very happily in Washington, which is to say that the Russian approach in the Middle East is uh, the correct one and India agrees with that. I think by and large Mr. Modi here is reflecting the foreign policy consensus in India. This is not the view of his own party. His own party, of course, you know, uh, believes that the only correct view in West Asia or in the Middle East is that uh, that is enunciated by Israel. They are very close to the Israelis. But the consensus in India uh, is, is not with that. The consensus remains that a more kind of balanced approach in the Middle East is necessary. So Modi said this as well. But again, as I said, we shouldn't exaggerate that. It doesn't mean that India is not tilting, you know, like the Philippines, away from the United States towards Russia and China. What it means is Mr. Modi is, you know, saying this because that's the prevailing consensus in the Indian foreign policy establishment, and also Mr. Modi is being pragmatic because they are, you know, they are signing these major uh, deals, energy deals and arms deals, which are part of his agenda as much as they are part of the Russian agenda. And uh, why does Modi want to be seen as this kind of aggressive uh, uh, leader of India? Yeah, Mr. Modi comes from a tradition of foreign policy that believes that every uh, crisis must be, you know, uh, taken in hand in a muscular way. And there's no question that they use the purchase of arms as a way to, say, to, to signal their strength, you know, to say that we are a stronger uh, country. Why didn't they, for instance, sit down with the Russians and talk about food security and talk about new uh, agricultural mechanisms to help uh, Indian farmers who are undergoing a big crisis. You know, there was no conversation about that. There was no conversation about the water crisis in India. Perhaps talk to the Russians who have very successful irrigation uh, projects to bring in some kind, some of their know-how to help the Indian countryside, you know, with irrigation, with harnessing rainwater, things like that. None of that was on the table. What was interesting for them is this kind of muscular, uh, aggressive tone uh, by projecting India as a major military power buying arms. Now, this is a dangerous thing because, you see, the Pakistanis have been buying uh, weapons from China and from the United States. And this, you know, every time India has a big buy of weapons, the Pakistanis buy weapons and the Indian buy. This is the kind of arms race that continues to impoverish South Asia. And in a sense, there is nothing progressive about uh, making your own weapons. 
The question that should be raised of these deals is why are these deals necessary in the first place? You know, it is a pity that uh, so much of the BRICS dynamic is about big business and is about energy and weaponry. Uh, you know, uh, an alternative needs to take place. And therefore, at the, uh, at the Goa BRICS meeting, there was, a, uh, there was a kind of alternative BRICS discussion that took place where people were trying to raise some of these other issues. So we should never allow uh, these governments to frame uh, their, uh, in, you know, their international relations around the kind of commerce they do with each other. Other forms of commerce are required, and those are sadly off the table. So Vijay, here you're talking about BRICS from below. BRICS from below, correct. All right, Vijay, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot.